Hello, my name is Stephen Hernandez. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Computer Science at Virginia Commonwealth University. Today, we're going to discuss our paper about a lightweight and standalone IoT system, which we use for Wi-Fi sensing. We'll start off by discussing some background on what Wi-Fi sensing is and how it's achieved. Um, namely, we'll look at a Wi-Fi signal metric called channel state information. Next, I'll discuss a bit more about the open source IoT system that we designed. Um, and using that system, we'll then look at some experiments that we did. Uh, we'll conclude with some discussion on future work, uh, concluding remarks, and uh, leave the floor open for questions. At the top of this presentation, uh, I'll lay out some of the following key contributions and findings uh, that we had from this paper. We developed an open source IoT CSI toolkit. Uh, the goal of this toolkit is to allow fellow researchers to explore Wi-Fi sensing in a more scalable way. We'll then demonstrate the ease of deployment of the solution in a few scenarios, demonstrating the need for mobility and repositioning of receivers for Wi-Fi sensing tasks. Some key statistics we find is that repositioning of transmitter and receiver allows us to find optimal sensing locations, which allow us to increase accuracy by 29.4%. Um, and also, because the toolkit is designed around a lightweight microcontroller, uh, we show that recording CSI while the receiver is mobile can also increase the accuracy, um, and in some cases by 28.2%. Uh, let's begin with some background on Wi-Fi sensing. Uh, Wi-Fi sensing is a technique which detects variations in radio signals uh, in Wi-Fi networks. These variations are then used to understand physical characteristics of the environment. Uh, this is particularly interesting from the point of view of device-free sensing. So for device-free sensing, we can perform uh, sensing tasks on a human target, without requiring the target to wear any sort of cumbersome sensors directly on their body. Additionally, because we use Wi-Fi, uh, which has fairly ubiquitous deployment in our homes, offices, uh, and in stores, Wi-Fi sensing could easily be used in many indoor areas. Uh, some specific use cases that have appeared in this area are localization, hand gesture recognition, uh, body gesture recognition, and even as fine-grained tasks as heartbeat detection and breathing detection. The two core signal metrics used in Wi-Fi sensing are RSSI and CSI. RSSI stands for Received Signal Strength Indicator. Um, for RSSI, each packet that is sent, we can collect a single measurement describing the signal. Uh, this is shown in the bottom plot to the right. CSI, shown on the top plot, um, stands for channel state information. For CSI, each time instance, we can collect a vector of 52 attributes, um, these 52 attributes indicating subcarrier frequencies uh, with a specific symbol being sent on those frequencies. Channel state information is a metric used in orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, or OFDM. OFDM is used in Wi-Fi systems to encode data on multiple frequencies so that we can transmit multiple symbols in parallel. Uh, the fact that the selected frequencies are orthogonal uh, in the frequency domain uh, ensures that the center of each given subcarrier frequency is null uh, for all of the other selected subcarrier frequencies. This prevents interference between the symbols uh, which are uh, being transmitted in parallel. CSI is estimated using the following equation. Um, at the receiver, we receive a complex vector y, and y is a result of the input symbol x, uh, which is affected by some parameters h and noise. In this case, uh, the complex vector H for CSI uh, contains an element per subcarrier with a real and imaginary component. We can use these components to then derive amplitude and phase for the subcarrier using 
the bottom equations. Uh, now let's look at the IoT-based Wi-Fi sensing system uh, that's been designed, that we designed specifically for this work. There are three components which uh, we designed and, and developed, uh, with the first being the ESP32 CSI tool. This tool can work standalone or can be combined with a few other components. Uh, for example, the second component, which is an Android CSI collector app. Finally, uh, we design a deep learning system which can train a neural network on the collected CSI and can be used for real-time predictions at the ESP32 or the Android phone. First, we look at the main tool we designed. Uh, this is the ESP32 CSI tool. The ESP32 is a dual-core microcontroller with onboard Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. We have three distinct firmware applications which are used for CSI collection on the ESP32. Uh, first, we have the access point firmware. So we run this on the ESP32, and any Wi-Fi-enabled device, a smartphone or a laptop, can connect to the access point. Uh, if the device then sends packets to the access point, the ESP32 can then collect CSI based on those packets. Next, uh, we have a sibling firmware, which is uh, the station firmware. Uh, this can allow another ESP32 to act as that transmitting device. Um, this access point and station firmware, they're both active, uh, which means that they require a connection, and a distinct connection between one another to actually collect CSI. The third, where, uh, sorry, the third firmware, on the other hand, is the passive firmware. Uh, this does not require an active connection between the station or access point to collect channel state information. Instead, uh, the ESP32 will passively listen on a given Wi-Fi channel for packets, uh, which it's able to sniff. The link at the bottom of the slide has more information um, about the open source code base for this. So uh, now there are other tools which are used to collect channel state information. Specifically, uh, the Intel 5300 network interface card is very popular, um, as is uh, the Atheros network interface card. Um, the issue is with these tools is uh, the network interface card is connected, must be connected to a full computer or laptop through PCIe um, to actually record the CSI. This gives them the disadvantage of not working as a standalone device directly. Um, the ESP32, on the other hand, which we're using, can work as a standalone device. And because of the small size and weight, um, it could be much easier to deploy. Specifically, uh, I'm interested in the, deploy the deployment of the CSI collecting devices um, in massive deployments. Uh, where we want a large number of these. So having it standalone would be much easier in these cases. So in addition to the ESP32 code base, we also have an Android CSI collector app. When the transmitter sends frames to the ESP32 receiver, uh, the receiver then sends the CSI data through a serial port connection over USB on the go to the Android device. Um, it can then collect record, annotate, uh, and even visualize the data uh, that we're collecting. So once we've collected the data, we need to pre-process the data, train the model, and perform real-time predictions. So pre-processing for our evaluations uses principal component analysis and discrete wavelet transformation. After pre-processing, we can perform model training. We use Keras, which is an open source uh, machine learning toolkit, um, which has a TensorFlow backend. Uh, using this, we create a dense neural network with four densely connected layers plus some dropout layers. After training the model, we wish to perform real-time predictions. Um, because we use this TensorFlow backend and uh, because of the design, the specific design of our dense neural network, we're able to use TensorFlow Lite, which allows us to run inference either on the Android smartphone or even on the ESP32 directly. Uh, this is important so that we actually do uh, keep to our goal of having a standalone system. So here's a high level uh, system diagram showing two of the methods for collecting CSI. 
On the top, we have the active method where the transmitter communicates directly to the receiver, uh, which then collects CSI and it can even then send it to the Android phone and then TensorFlow Lite um, as desired. Um, this is active because the receiver has an active connection to the transmitter. They, they know of each other and they're sending data back and forth. On the other hand, uh, the diagram on the bottom shows a passive system. In this case, there's still a transmitter and receiver which are communicating to one another. Uh, in the diagram, they're shown as ESP32s, uh, but they could be a, a laptop and an access point uh, or router. There is though, uh, in the gray box, a passive ESP32, uh, which passively sniffs for packets, uh, which can be used for channel estimation. When it sniffs such packets, it can then share it to Android and TensorFlow Lite. One observation here is that in the passive case, we cannot ensure a constant high rate of channel state information collection. Uh, this is because the passive device is not able to actively negotiate with the other devices. Additionally, in cases where symbols are missed due to some external in interference, uh, the passive ESP32 cannot request a retransmission to collect the CSI. Um, as a result, so we can see in the figure to the right, as transmission rate increases on the x-axis, the passive receiver blue line is not able to successfully collect channel state information uh, quite as well as the active pair, which is the red line. Even so, there are some interesting opportunities we can find uh, with using the passive case. So with backend discussed, now we can look at the experiments that we've performed to evaluate the system. Uh, the use case we look at is device-free human movement tracking. Um, so we have one transmitter and one receiver. The human target moves in two directions at three depths in a square area of approximately six meters by six meters. The different classes of movement performed by the target is shown as arrows in the figure to the right. So oops. here we can see two experimental setups. First, uh, we place the transmitter and receiver on the edge of the target area to the left. And second, we place the transmitter and receiver in the center target area. With the target walking back and forth at each of the arrows, we can see the prediction capabilities um, for each experiment. You can see the model is able to predict depth for the edge case at an accuracy of 87.5%. Um, if we were to put the transmitter and receiver in the center position, uh, we achieve a slightly lower accuracy at 81.6%, still around the same value. On the other hand, if we consider direction, the edge position can make a prediction uh, for depth at 89.4%, uh, sorry, for direction, uh, while the center position yields an accuracy of only 58.2%. We expect this is because the signal interference caused by the target moving in the line of sight is a mirror image for both directions. If we look at the confusion matrix for the model, we can see that most confusion occurs in the direction that the target is moving rather than confusion in depth. So if we're trying to understand direction, we know that uh, the centered position transmitter and receiver is less than optimal. Suppose the transmitter has to be static though. Uh, let's say it's uh, the Wi-Fi access point in our building. Can we move the receiver to more optimally distinguish depth and direction? That's what we try here. So uh, transmitter stays the same as shown in the diagram on the left, uh, but the receiver can be placed in four different locations. P1, which is the same as the previous uh, less than optimal case, and also P2, P3, and P4. In these plots, we uh, B and C, we plot the number of CSI frames used per prediction on the x-axis and accuracy on the y-axis. Uh, for, for figure B, uh, we see the depth prediction, uh, while figure C shows the accuracy for direction prediction. In figure B, we can see as we increase the number of CSI frames, the accuracy increases similarly for all positions except for P3. So as CSI frames increase, um, we converge to about 90% accuracy. 
in figure C, we can see the position P4, uh, which is in pink, achieves very high results for directional accuracy. Uh, thus, because it performs the best for directional prediction, and it performs similarly to others for uh, depth prediction, we'd say that P4 is a good choice uh, for the final position of the receiver. Now we look at the, the use of ESP32 in a mobile scenario. I'll note um, the other common tools that exist for channel state information collection are quite cumbersome. So uh, it's hard to demonstrate mobility on CSI receivers for those other tools. Um, on the other hand, uh, the, the small standalone design of the ESP32 uh, when using our toolkit uh, can make it a lot easier to deploy the tool in mobile scenarios. It can be uh, handheld very easily. So um, here we compare the static positions P2 and P3 compared to the mobile case where the receiver moves from P3 to P2. We can see the dotted lines are P2 and P3. Um, when the receiver is static and the human target is mobile in the target area. On the other hand, the black line shows the accuracy when the target moves uh, the same way in the target area, uh, but also the receiver moves from position three down to position two at the same time. Uh, we can see with mobility, the accuracy is higher uh, than the static case. This is an interesting area which we are exploring further uh, because as I said, most of the research that exists uh, keeps the receiver static because it's a bit cumbersome to, to work with. Um, so hopefully uh, the use of our tool can be additionally useful for fellow researchers in exploring the effects of uh, mobility um, in CSI recording. So the toolkit and supplementary tools used for analysis are available as open source projects on my GitHub page. Um, if you're interested in learning more or getting your hands on this tool, to work with Wi-Fi sensing, localization, or some other tasks. Uh, the link's at the top of this slide. I hope uh, that this tool and all the systems can help fellow researchers who are looking at areas such as understanding the effects of mobility on CSI Wi-Fi sensing, and also understanding um, more ubiquitous, massive deployments of Wi-Fi sensing devices um, through the very cheap and self-contained nature of the ESP32 microcontroller. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me or to take a look at the given link. Thank you.